solidifying, and then we're going back to oxidation reduction. Um, I added like 10 minutes before I left to drive over here, so like 4.10, um, the slides and handouts for chapter 16 that we're using. We're not doing all of chapter 16, we're just doing oxidation reduction half reactions from it. So that's what those slides are on. Um, I will add the relevant um, <laughs> learning objectives to that as well. Um, Oh yeah, the other thing was, I guess it was brought to my attention that I was maybe not clear enough about the fact you can take the, um, still you can take either of the element quizzes if you're not happy with your score on those, and you can take the polyatomic ion quiz at any lab period. So that actually, yeah, I'll say if you wanted to take it really quick at the beginning, so like if you're Monday lab, but you wanted to take it on a Wednesday, you can stay after class and take it just at the beginning of Wednesday's lab. Just really quick, um, probably get less time then because as soon as chemical, chemicals comes out, you need to have a lab coat and goggles on. Um, so just a reminder, you can still retake those any lab period. Um, I have extras just in my backpack at all times. <clears throat> are there actually, are there any other questions about things before we get started? Yeah. They're in the... It's, it's under chapter eight, the preview for chapter eight. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you got a preview chapter eight, it's at the very bottom. I should say chapter 16 handout, chapter 16 slides. I didn't realize that those didn't, that module for whatever reason didn't copy over. Um, I missed a checkbox. Uh, in terms of an exam, so we gotta do chapter 16 and chap chapter eight still. The exam will be after that. Um, I went back and looked at how long my video was for these two chapters, and it was four hours. So it might still be a couple weeks before we do finally get to that, but we'll see. Basically, when we finish, it'll be the next week, Friday, that the exam will be, when we finish chapter eight. All right, so oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, which oxidation reduction reactions involve the transfer of electrons um, and they're either oxidation or reduction. And actually, both happening at the same time, but we'll get into that. So redox reactions, which is a shortening of reduction and oxidation, are responsible for the rusting of iron, the bleaching of hair, and the production of electricity in batteries. Many, but not all, redox reactions involve the reaction of a substance with oxygen. So it's going to be a lot of them, uh, but not all of them. So some examples of redox reactions. So we have hydrogen reacting with oxygen, <clears throat> which is the reaction that powers the space shuttle uh, to form water. And we have iron reacting with oxygen to form iron oxide, which is rust. And then methane combining with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. Uh, and that's the combustion of natural gas. So a lot of these also, I mean, all of these ones are combustion reactions. So uh, combustion reactions are a subset of, or sorry, I guess iron's not, this is not combustion. Uh, combustion reactions are a subset of oxidation reduction. They have their own slides though. <clears throat> but redox reactions do not only involve oxygen. So this reaction here where we have salt, uh, sodium, we have chlorine reacting to become sodium chloride is also an oxidation reduction reaction. So the fundamental de definition of oxidation, of oxidation is the loss of electrons. And the fundamental definition of reduction is a gain of electrons. Um, there are some other acronyms that float around out there. Leo goes Gurr is one of them, but I've always liked oil rig. So, Oxidation is loss, and then reduction is gain. <clears throat> so just keep that in mind. Oxidation is loss, so if something loses electrons, it's being oxidized. If something gains electrons, it's being reduced. Wait for the scribbling. 
That's okay. So oxidation and reduction must occur together. So something has to lose electrons. If something loses electrons, something else has to gain those electrons. They have to go somewhere. Um, all right, one substance loses them, which is our oxidation. Then another substance gains them. That's reduction. Um, it says for now you simply need to be able to identify redox reactions, um, but we're going to go more into it right after this. Um, so these are some of the sort of like identifying like classes of, of reactions that are redox reactions. Is a substance reacts with elemental oxygen. So that was like our iron in the previous one is reacting with O2. Or a metal reacts with a nonmetal. So that example was, I think on the previous slide, sodium plus chlorine. All right, so we have our sodium metal reacting with chlorine. It's a nonmetal. But more generally, and what we're going to be using actually in this class is if one substance transfers electrons to another substance. So let's identify which of these are redox reactions. Sounds turned on. So if we have lithium, lithium reacting with chlorine, we can go back to our list here. So we don't have elemental oxygen involved, but we have a metal reacting with a nonmetal. So that would be a redox reaction. Why? Um, we haven't gotten into oxidation states yet. Okay. It's still two and two, right. So I mean, we can talk about this a little bit right now. So lithium here, whenever you have the element by itself, has a zero oxidation state, right? It also has a zero charge. Okay. So for this class, for every example that I can think of, oxidation state and charge are interchangeable. Okay. <clears throat> so the lithium here, its charge is zero. The chlorine also has a charge of zero. But on this side, we now have lithium as the ion, this is Li plus, and chlorine is also an ion. So what happened is we had one electron being transferred from the lithium to the chlorine. So that lithium became positive charge and chlorine became a negative charge. So then our lithium lost an electron, so oxidation is loss, lithium was oxidized, Chlorine gained that electron, so chlorine was reduced. Reduction is gain. You can kind of see that in this next example as well. So we have aluminum here with zero charge, and we have tin with a two plus charge. On the opposite side of a reaction in our products, aluminum now has a three plus charge, and tin has a zero charge. So electrons were transferred from, this is important because Basically, if something goes from zero charge to a positive charge, it had to lose electrons. So our electrons have gone from the aluminum into the tin. So then somebody tell me what, was, oxi was uh, aluminum oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. Oxidation is lost, so it lost electrons. So this is also a redox reaction. This next reaction, we have lead nitrate we have lithium chloride to become lead chloride and lithium nitrate. So if we go back to just these simple ways to identify, um, we don't have any substances reacting with elemental oxygen. Oxygen's in there, but it's a part of nitrate, so not elemental. And then a metal, we don't have any metals reacting with, or a single metal reacting with a nonmetal. So we've got this compound well, one compound reacting with another compound. And both of these are already charged. And actually, if we look at these charges, so nitrate has a minus one charge, right? But there's two of them. So it's a two minus. So that means the charge on lead is two plus. So if we look on the right side, chlorine also has a one minus charge, but there's two of them. So it's a two minus overall charge on chlorines. So lead still has a two plus charge. And then for lithium, the same thing is true. So everything is, has the same charge on the left side as it is on the right side. 
So we haven't exchanged any electrons. So this is not redox. This last one, we have carbon reacting with oxygen. And it is O2, so it's elemental oxygen. So this is a redox reaction. Um, don't get confused, though. So if you had something reacting with, like, nitrite, right? This is not elemental oxygen. This is still part of the compound. It's part of nitrate, or sorry, nitrite. So when I say elemental oxygen, it needs to be O2 by itself. It won't be combined with anything. And then it's the same with the metal, right? Like one single metal reacting with okay. Yeah, because these things, and actually that's probably another thing that should be on this list. Usually when it's a redox reaction, you have things that are by themselves. If you have something that's by itself reacting with something that's by itself, or sometimes even part of a compound, um, that usually involves an exchange of electrons. Um, but the reverse is not also always true. So if you had compounds reacting with each other, it could be a redox reaction. It might not be, though. But again, we'll cover that when we go over some of the stuff from Chapter 16. So like I said, combustion reactions are a type of redox reaction, so they're a subset. Um, they're characterized by the reaction of a substance with oxygen to form one or more oxygen-containing compounds. So when I say one or more, we had iron oxide. And I'm not balancing this, but just showing it, right? We had iron oxide or iron with oxygen to form iron oxide, which whatever that charge would be. But we only get one compound out on the other side. So this is key when it says one or more oxygen-containing compounds. And yeah, often including water. Uh, combustion reactions are exothermic. And we all know that from practical experience. But you can generalize that too. Say all, ex, ex, or, uh, all combustion reactions are exothermic. Um, compounds containing carbon and hydrogen, or carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, always form carbon dioxide and water upon combustion. So I think the example we were given earlier was methane. There's CH4 plus, oops, not H2O, O2. So that's our elemental oxygen. And then you would end up with some amount of CO2 plus some amount of water. And again, not balanced necessarily. Uh, it's not balanced. But you're always going to get CO2 and water when you're burning carbon and hydrogen or carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, so ethanol and alcoholic beverages combust to form carbon dioxide and water. So you can burn that. And now almost all uh, gasoline has some amount of ethanol in it. Although I did see when I was driving across the country, you can buy clear gas in some places which is silly because all gas is clear, um, but it doesn't have any ethanol added to it, and people pay a premium for that. Um, but the octane in gasoline will also react with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. So one of the primary combustion reactions in an engine. <clears throat> so let's write a balanced equation for the combustion of liquid pentane so C5, H12, uh, which is a component of gasoline. So it's a combustion reaction. So we're starting with our, we've been given our carbon and hydrogen source. And now that's going to be reacting with elemental oxygen. Actually, I'm going to give myself a little more space. And that's going to form, because we have carbon hydro and hydrogen, we're going to get H2O plus CO2. So every uh, combustion reaction that involves carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is going to form those two products. In reality, you also get carbon monoxide. And that's why you can't burn like a propane stove inside. 
because you'll fall asleep. <laughs> the forever sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not recommended. Um, okay, so now we can balance this. So I'm just going to start on the left here with the carbon. So I want five carbons over here. Um, and this is one of those situations, again, where we have oxygen as a part of two different products on this side. So we want to save that until last to balance, um, especially since it's on its own over on this side. So we're going to balance the hydrogens next. So we have 12 hydrogens on the left side. And so I'm going to multiply this water by six. And now we'll count up how many oxygens we have. So we have six oxygens here. And we have... 10 oxygens here. I'm just going to write OX so you know it's oxygen, because otherwise it's 60 and 100. Oh, I guess I could use a, these are zeros. So we need 16 oxygens on the left side. So we'll multiply this by 8. Now it should be balanced. So yeah, combustion reactions are actually pretty simple. If you can just remember that they form CO2 and water, and it's whatever I tell you that you're combining with oxygen. You just balance it. Uh, the easiest way to get tripped up on these is when, so this first step where I balanced carbon first, I want carbon. If you start trying to balance oxygen at this point, you're gonna have a bad time. So I think, yeah, as a general rule, this applies balance oxygen last in combustion reactions. Yeah, I think oxygen more often than not causes problems. For the most part, though, nothing changes with this. It's just it's, it's, you identify it as reacting with oxygen and that's it. Mm -hmm. To form water and... Water and CO2. And then, yeah, so you balance... Really, any reaction, you balance like any other reaction. They all balance the same. Okay. Actually, I said that, and I should immediately take it back. Redox reactions have their own whole thing. So that's the only time where it gets different. <laughs> Every other reaction, though, um, those are special. So we can classify our chemical reactions. And again, this is like one of the best things. I mean, you can almost just take a piece of paper and like draw boxes on it and like try and fit everything. You know, we shouldn't put people in boxes, but we can put chemical ideas into boxes as much as we want. And it really, really helps organize things in your head. So we can classify these by what happens. So we have precipitation reactions. We form a solid. We have acid-base reactions, which it's in the name. We have an acid. So, you know, let's write an example here. Hydrochloric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide. Like the big important thing is that you have some hydrogen reaction, reacting with some hydroxide. All right, so those are gas uh, acid base reactions. There's gas evolution reactions, um, which again, as noted here, many gas evolution reactions are also acid base reactions and vice versa. So this forms a gas. And usually it's forming a gas from two liquids. So you mix two liquids together or two aqueous solutions together and you get a gas out. Because there are, like you could theoretically, I mean technically call combustion reactions gas, ev gas evolution reactions because gases are formed, but you're also starting with at least one gas in those in every case is oxygen. So we have our oxidation reduction reactions, which there was a list of those, um, but the best way to remember it is an exchange of electrons. And then combustion reactions are specifically reacting with oxygen. And usually to form I think the only exception maybe is like hydrogen, or if you have hydrogen plus oxygen, then you get H2O, and there's no carbon dioxide. 
But for most things, you're going to get CO2 water. So we can classify these reactions that way, or um, we can classify the, them by what the atoms are doing. So this is sort of separate, but adjacent to uh, classifying them by what, what happens. So the results of those reactions, right? Forming a solid, forming a gas, neutralizing acids and bases. Um, but you can also look at the structure of a reaction and we have these different ways of doing that. So there's a synthesis or combination reaction. We take A, we take B, and we combine them into AB. So a simple example of that would be something like the sodium plus chlorine forming sodium chloride. All right. So we can classify that as an oxidation reduction reaction or redox. We can also classify it as a synthesis reaction or combination, so we're combining two things together. Decomposition is the opposite of that. Um, so we're taking a single thing and breaking it into its component pieces. Um, so we can actually reverse this reaction to form water and say we're gonna break water apart into hydrogen and oxygen. I guess we can put this over here. So we're taking the water and we're breaking it into two separate things. And it won't always be two separate elements. It could be two separate compounds too. Um, but we're breaking it apart. There's a displacement reaction or also a single displacement reaction. Uh, where we're replacing one atom with another. All right, so we've got um, A plus BC and we get out AC plus B. There's a missed opportunity for ACDC here. Um, I think of, a of one off the top of my head. Not a perfect one, but if you had um, lead chloride plus, oh yeah, yeah, lead chloride plus iodine to get um, lead iodide plus Cl2. So we're replacing there the iod or the chlorine with the iodine in that reaction. Again, not balanced. You can balance those for extra practice. Where am I going to put this? It doesn't fit anywhere. It's displaced. <laughs> uh, so then the double displacement is actually the reaction that we've probably seen the most of, um, where we have AB reacting with CD, and we get AD. BC. Again, missed opportunity. Um, so that would be something like we had iron chloride plus potassium nitrate, right? And we take those cations and we leave them in the same orientation, but we just swap the anions. So you get NO3 2 plus. Uh, potassium chloride. All right, double displacement reaction. So two things have changed places. Oh, well, I guess I could have saved those examples for here. So if we have simpler substances combining to form more complex, again, this is the sodium chloride, right? Sodium plus chlorine to get our sodium chloride. And we get out a single product. The decomposition, I'm just going to go through these really fast. Uh, decomposition reactions, where we have, again, a complex substance that decomposes to form simpler ones. We have one reactant. And then the example here, like the one I gave, right, water decomposing into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Our single displacement reaction where we have um, really three species present, but we have BC, um, and then we're replacing, I guess the way this is written, we're replacing B with A um, in our products. So we have zinc reacting with copper chloride, and we get out zinc chloride and copper metal. This is how 
some batteries worked. I think these are the same elements that they used in like the Egyptian batteries that they found. Just out of curiosity, the one before, that's like a saltwater layer, yeah? This? Yeah, where is that? Well, this is, this is what I think I've mentioned this several times. If you take salt water and you stick a nine volt battery in it, you'll start getting bubbles. And at one of the terminals, can't remember which of these is which, at one of the terminals, you'll get hydrogen, and at the other terminal, you'll get oxygen. And this is a redox reaction. So in this case, the battery is providing electrons to, um, it's providing electrons to the hydrogen, I believe, and it's taking away electrons from the oxygen. Or from the, from the water. Wait, let me think about this. Yeah, it's separating them. So it's, it's facilit it's, the voltage in the battery is forcing an exchange of electrons to form these two. And you can do the reverse process to make electricity. Single displacement, the double displacement. So we've done a lot of these. Um, precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions are also double displacement. Uh, and the gas evolution reactions are going to be double displacement. So then we can classify these now by what the atoms are doing rather than what our result is or what type of products we get into the synthesis, synthesis, decomposition, single displacement, and double displacement. All right, so let's classify these according to what the atoms do. So for A, what kind of reaction is A? Single displacement, double displacement. Is it a double displacement? Single displacement, right? So we have aluminums by itself here. Bonus question, is this a redox reaction? It's a redox reaction too. So it's a single. And it's a redox. So we have aluminum, again, point brought up earlier. You have aluminum by itself. On this side, when it's combined with phosphate, it has a charge. Uh, for B, what type of reaction is this? Synthesis, decomposition, double displacement, single displacement? Double displacement. One of the ways that you can do this, too, is if it helps, you can just label these as A, B, C, D, and then track where they end up on the other side. So we have A here, but we have hydroxide, oops, sorry, which is D, and then potassium was C, and that got the sulfate, which is B. All right, so we exchanged um, D and B. Uh, for C then, what type of reaction is this one? Yes. Synthesis, because we have two reactants and a single product. And it's also a redox reaction. Uh, for D, there's only one type left. Yeah, it's a decomposition reaction. And again, it's a redox reaction. Not necessarily. I can't think of specific examples. I want to say not necessarily. Okay. Can you do the, the, the crisscross method with D to show us how it's redox? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here, because we have chlorine, right, so chlorine has a one minus charge, and there's two of them. So the charge on copper to balance that two minus, so let's just say it's a two minus, then copper has to have a two plus. So if you're, I guess, to strictly use that, you know, reversed crisscross, this would be two plus and one minus. And then copper here has a zero charge because it's by itself. And chlorine also has a zero charge because it's by itself. 
So these two electrons are coming from the chlorine and they're being transferred to the copper. So they're both neutral. So the chlorine is losing electrons. So it's being, yeah, so it's being oxidized and the copper is being reduced. Yeah, okay. Oh, slide 20 there. Now we're gonna talk more about oxidation reduction. I think it does get a little bit, it's easier once we get into some of the uh, naming oxidation states or, or identifying oxidation states. Um, and they're just like, almost always just like charges. There are some uh, exceptions, but those are determined by rules. So one definition of oxidation is the gaining of oxygen. So there's slow oxidation where rust is produced by the oxidation of iron. So you're adding oxygen to iron. We can have rapid oxidation where we're adding oxygen to methane. So we get CO2 in water, right? So we're adding oxygen to it. So it's being oxidized. That's why it's called that or why it was originally called that. And then reduction is just the reverse of that process where you're removing oxygen. So I think it comes from their original understandings of these things. Um, but redox reactions do not always involve oxygen. So we could have an oxidation reaction like this, but you can also have a reaction with uh, chlorine where you react lithium with chlorine. And so the more complete definition of a redox reaction is like I was telling you before, or it was in slides even, where oxidation is the loss of electrons, right? Oil and reduction is the gain of electrons or the rig. I write these in caps. Oil, rig. So oxidation and reduction must occur together. Again, we have to have somewhere for those electrons to go and there has to be somewhere the electrons are coming from. Um, yeah, if one loses, the other one must gain. <clears throat> so in this reaction, our hydrogen is oxidized. And this is where things do get a little confusing with oxidation reduction reactions. Because we also have this thing called a reducing agent. I'm not gonna lie, I don't like these terms either. So the thing is, you can always identify, just use oxidation and reduction. What's being oxidized, what's being reduced. And then the agent is the opposite of that. So hydrogen is oxidized. Let's do not that, but let's do this. Let's make it blue. Hydrogen is oxidized. So it's the reducing agent. The reducing agent causes the reduction of another substance. So in this case, hydrogen is oxidized, so oxidation is loss. So hydrogen has these, or these electrons, and it's like re reverse theft. It's forcing, in this case, the oxygen to take those electrons. So it's forcing the oxygen to be reduced. And in the reverse fashion, oxygen is reduced, right? So reduction is gain. So it's taking those electrons or receiving them, which makes it the oxidizing agent. So it's oxidizing hydrogen by giving it, sorry, by taking those electrons. Again, I know it is about as clear as mud it's about as clear as the sky outside. Um, but just start with oxidation and reduction, figure out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and then they are the opposite for each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so again, oil rig, oxidation is lost, reduction is gain. So oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain. The oxidizing agent is the substance that's being reduced. The reducing agent is the substance that's being oxidized. I'm going to try and focus on just oxidation and reduction 
and then you can deduce from that what the agents are. Okay, so for these, I wanted to do this, do it this way. We're going to do oxidation, reduction. So oxidation, well, reduction is going to be red. Oxidation is going to be blue because for some reason in my mind, oxygen is blue. So if we identify the substance being oxidized and the substance being reduced in each reaction, I'm surprised that we haven't talked about the definitions of oxidation states. Anyways, so potassium, look at potassium. Like I told you before, if it's by itself, it's the element, it's a zero charge. So this is a zero charge on it, or a zero oxidation state as well. Chlorine is also elemental chlorine. And again, chlorine is one of the Brinkelhoff compounds, so it's diatomic. Also zero charge. In our potassium chloride, we now have charges. So for this to be balanced, potassium has a one minus or one plus charge. Chlorine has a one minus charge. So potassium went from zero to positive. So is uh, potassium oxidized or reduced? It goes from a zero charge to a positive charge. A mixed bag. It's oxidized. Oxidation is loss. So if it loses one electron, that means it now has a positive charge. So then, whoops. So oxidized. Gosh darn it. And then the other element that's been, you know, that we know has been oxidized or reduced, that has to be reduced. Because that electron has to go somewhere and it went to the chlorine. That's the only place for it to go. So if we look at B, aluminum, and tin, and well, I guess I should do this. We should do it this way too. So on the opposite side, if you were to reverse this reaction, potassium going back this way, right? So potassium goes from a plus charge to a neutral charge, so it gains an electron. <clears throat> mm, no, we're not going to do it like this. We'll, we'll get to the, this kind of thing later. Okay, let's just go on to B. Let's just keep, keep it focused on the reactants, where things are happening, and then there's a result in the forward direction. So if we have aluminum and tin, here now we have, right, tin obviously has a charge, 2 plus. And aluminum is elemental aluminum, so it's by itself, has zero charge. And then on the right side, now aluminum has a three plus charge, and tin has a zero charge. So is aluminum oxidized or reduced? Oxidized again. Again, so we're going from uh, zero charge to a positive charge being oxidized, and then our tin must be the reduced, or must be reduced then. It's receiving those electrons. So usually is it the cation that are oxidized? Oxidized or reduced. It can be either or. So if you're going from, if you're going from a neutral metal, um, like in our first example here, we have a neutral, if we have a metal and a non-metal, the metal is going to have a positive charge afterwards. Because the metals are always cations. That's where I was doing my head. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Metals are always cations. Um, so if you have a metal in a redox reaction reacting with a non-metal, then your metal will always be um, oxidized and your non-metal be, will be reduced. OK, so copper, copper, carbon, and oxygen. Combining to form CO2. Um, this is where we haven't really gotten into the oxidation states yet. But again, anything in its elemental form has a zero charge. It's also a zero oxidation state. And then oxygen, at least oxygen is one we've talked about, an individual oxygen is going to have a two minus charge. 
So oxygen's oxidation state is also 2 minus. But we have two of these. So our oxidation state on carbon is going to be plus 4. So we have carbon going from, again, from 0, and it's becoming a positive 4 oxidation state. So is it oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. So then is oxygen oxidized or reduced? Reduced. And no, it will not always be that the first element or the first thing is oxidized and the second thing is reduced. That is just, There's just a pattern here. There's a pattern here. There's a pattern here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now we're identifying oxidizing and reducing agents. Again, I'm not a huge fan of these either, so we're going to reverse this, our reducing agent. I'm going to make blue. And our, all right. Oxidizing agent is going to be red because our reducing agent is oxidized and our oxidizing agent is reduced. Okay, so like I said, we're going to start out by identifying what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. So we're starting with zero. Oh, these are the same, these are the same reactions, <clears throat> right? So we go from zero to plus and minus. So on our previous one, um, potassium was oxidized. So then potassium on the product side is our reducing agent. So it gave its electrons to chlorine. So that makes, right, chlorine was reduced. So it makes chlorine our oxidizing agent. All right, so for B, first do, what is being oxidized? Did I hear aluminum? Yeah. yeah. Sure murmurs. Aluminum. So then what is our reducing agent? Aluminum on the product side. <clears throat> so then our, uh, what's, I guess the question is, what is being reduced? <coughs> it's a tin. So then the tin on the product side is our oxidizing agent. Of course, you can't just identify that there is a very clear pattern here, <laughs> right? So carbon, again, is what we had as being oxidized. So carbon is also our reducing agent. And then oxygen was reduced, so it is our oxidizing agent. So... They're both the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent on both sides of the reaction. <laughs> it's the direction that's important um, because those change if you flip the direction going the other way. But it can be helpful to just identify what's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and then you know that is your reducing agent or your oxidizing agent. It's just, yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot. Okay, so this is what I was talking about, though, oxidation states. It's <laughs> electron bookkeeping. So sometimes when we have charges involved, it's really easy to see. So like on this one, it's easy to see where the electrons are going. It is not always so easy. And so that's why we have these things called oxidation states. So when we don't have charges, we still need to know where these electrons are going. So what's being oxidized, what's being reduced? Um, yeah, we use our oxidation states to keep track of electrons um, in chemical reactions. So it's our bookkeeping. All the shared electrons are assigned to the most electronegative element. How did we not cover electronegativity on the periodic table yet? Huh. 
Huh. Well, we have rules that are that are that make it a little more clear. So the the electrons in a shared, so like in carbon sulf carbon disulfide here, sulfur is more electronegative than carbon. Um, electronegativity on the periodic table. It excludes the noble gases. Fluorine is the most electronegative. And then, for practical purposes, francium at the very bottom left is the least electronegative. So if you go up and to the right, you get more electronegative. If you go right and up, you get more electronegative. So the top right corner, so it's like a gradient towards fluorine, starting at, or I guess going up to fluorine, where fluorine's the most electronegative. Uh, but I think that's in chapter eight. Might be chapter nine. So the oxidation state or oxidation number, we then compute for each element based on the number of electrons assigned to it. So, so do not confuse oxidation state with ionic charge. They're not necessarily the same thing, but a lot of times they're similar. Yeah, the easiest way to assign oxidation numbers is to follow these rules. Let's zoom this in. <clears throat> so the oxidation state of an atom in a free element, zero. Those ones are pretty easy. So this is where I was saying, right, that's the same as its ionic charge. So the oxidation state of a monoatomic ion is equal to its charge. So we saw that too on that aluminum and tin problem right here. So calcium. Um, as this monoatomic ion, its oxidation state is plus two. For chlorine, it's a minus one. The sum of, of the oxidation states of all atoms in a neutral molecule or formula unit is zero. <clears throat> so the oxidation states here of hydrogen has to equal the uh, oxidation state for the reverse, op reverse sign oxidation state of oxygen to equal zero. And then an ion is equal to the charge of the ion. So if we add up the oxidation state on nitrogen with the oxidation state on three oxygens, three times the oxygens, then we will end up with negative one. Again, every, I, also I thought of that example of a, or the, the analogy that this is like learning a board game these are the rules. It's like reading the rules before playing the board game. Sometimes it's easier to start playing the game, um, but that's why we do examples. So in their compounds, group one metals have an oxidation state of plus one, right, which does line up with its ionic charge as well. And then group two metals have an oxidation state of plus two. Standard stuff. Um, again, those ones align with their... Um, ionic charge. And in their compounds, we assign nonmetals oxidation states according to the hierarchical table. Um, well, it says shown at left, but it's on the next slide, I think. Uh, entries at the top of the table have priority over entries at the bottom. So this will be for molecular compounds. We have nonmetals bound to nonmetals. There's a list of rules to determine whose oxidation state matters the most. So these rules are hierarchical, just meaning that um, the first rule has the top priority, and then so on and so forth down this list. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So fluorine will always beat out every other element in terms of determining what its charge will be. So if you had, for whatever reason, a crazy element like OF2, if we looked at the periodic table, we say the ionic charge that oxygen forms is a minus two, but when we're talking about oxidation states, we use this list of hierarchical rules, which says that fluorine is the top dog. So this is like the ace. And then, so if we have a minus one for each of these fluorines, our overall charge for fluorine will be uh, that minus one times two. And because this is a compound that has no charge, when we add up the oxidation states, they should equal zero. So what is the oxidation state on oxygen? So if we have 
negative two overall oxidation state for both the fluorines together. Then we have to have a positive two oxidation state for oxygen. So this is where we break from the charges that you memorize for the periodic table. But it's all, it's entirely based on this set of rules. So if any two of the rules conflict, follow the rule that is higher on the list, right? So we, oxygen gets beat by fluorine. So we got like our ace, king, queen, jack, uh, 10, nine. <laughs> um, so the high card wins, basically. Um, yeah, fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen. I'm trying to see if there's anything else. And then if you don't have fluorine, hydrogen, or oxygen, that's where you can use the charges that are on, you know, as we memorize them with the periodic table. Where group 7a is minus 1, group 6a is minus 2, group 5a is minus 3. All right, so let's assign oxidation states to each atom in each substance. So the first rule of all the rules of oxidation states is that any free element uh, has an oxidation state of zero. Right there, bigger over there. And I think, is it the second rule? Yeah. The second rule is that if we have a monoatomic ion, its oxidation state is equal to its charge. So this would be a plus two. Then for calcium chloride, we now have an ionic compound, but we'd say that the sum of oxidation states in all the atoms in a neutral molecule or formula unit, right, so technically ionic compounds or formula units, uh, has to equal zero. So the overall oxidation state here has to equal zero. And then to determine what our charge is on chlorine, we would go to our list here, and we see that chlorine is in our 7A. And we don't have oxygen, hydrogen, or fluorine. So we can assign chlorine a negative one. So each chlorine here has a negative one, but we have two of them, so multiply by two. So that plus whatever the oxidation state on calcium is has to equal zero. So what's the oxidation state of calcium then? Two plus, or plus two. We talk about, I'm not making a big deal of this distinction. All right, so let me write this first. So calcium is a plus two. Uh, chlorine is a minus one. I don't know this one, this, yeah, this comes up a lot on like exams. If I ask you in this question for C, what's the oxidation state on chlorine? I want the oxidation state for a single chlorine not the oxidation states of all of the chlorines together. Um, what I was talking about is the distinction is that when we talk about charges, it's the number and then the charge second. We talk about oxidation states, it's flipped. We do the charge first and the number second. For this... <laughs> I, I often just do it interchangeably as well. Um, so for carbon tetrafluoride, again, we have a molecule and a neutral molecule with no charge. So we first determine on our, or well, we need to determine which of these is going to, which is the highest on the hierarchical table because they're both nonmetals. And we have fluorine. Um, and then carbon, so sad it's not even on here. Um, so we have fluorine is what's going to determine it. So these have to equal zero because, again, our molecule has no charge. We're going to do four times negative one because we have four fluorine atoms with a minus one oxidation state. So then what is our charge on carbon? Or what is our oxidation state on carbon? So negative one times four. So oh. negative four, yeah. so positive four. And you could, of course, 
write out, um, you could write this out as an equation. So you could say that, you know, the charge on carbon is x plus four times minus one equals zero, and then solve for x. Um, now things get a little bit more interesting. So now we have a molecule again, but we have a charge on this molecule. So rather than equal zero, our oxidation states need to add up to equal the charge on that molecule. So in this case, negative one. And again, two nonmetals. So we've got to go to our chart here. So we don't have fluorine, we don't have hydrogen, but we do have oxygen. So we assign oxygen a negative two. So negative two, and we have two of those, so we multiply by two. And then we add to that, well, yeah, we'll add to that nitrogen's charge and whatever that is has to equal negative one. So this might be easier, I'll just do it up here. So we have x plus two times a negative two equals negative one. So we'll get x plus negative four equals negative one x equals uh, 3. So we do this, right, because then we're going to add plus 4. i take this, plus 4. That's actually, I don't need these parentheses necessarily, but... All right, so we add 4 to both sides, and we'll get 3 which we'll plug in here. So nitrogen equals plus three. Oxygen equals minus two. And again, I want the oxidation state of a single oxygen. Okay, so for sulfur trioxide, uh, again, we have two nonmetals sulfur and oxygen. So we're going to go to our hierarchical table. Uh, and oxygen here beats out sulfur because sulfur is in group 6A. So we then assign our charge of negative 2 to oxygen and then figure out what sulfur's charge needs to be. So this is going to equal 0. So this will be 3 oxygens times a minus 2. And we'll add to that whatever sulfur's oxidation state is, uh, which is going to be a plus six. So in sulfur equals plus six. Oxygen equals minus two. It's a lot of rules to remember, but I feel like these rules are very straightforward. It's really determining, if you don't have something that's like um, an element, standalone element, or a standalone ion, then you just figure out what the, what the oxidation state on the nonmetal is. And if it's written out properly, the most electronegative element is the second one or the last one, which is how it's supposed to be written. Any questions there? Nope. Oh, gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay. So if we assign our oxidation states here, so that carbon has a zero. We've already done some of this a little bit, but now we've known more, some more of these rules. We have elemental sulfur, which is also a zero. Um, without going back to that table, I can tell you that sulfur here is the charge that we're going to use, or the oxidation state that we're going to use. So if our oxidation state needs to equal zero, and we have two times minus two from sulfur, then copper or carbon has to be a plus four. So we have plus four, we have minus two. So sulfur has gone from zero to a negative two, carbon has gone from a zero to a plus four. So then carbon 
is losing electrons, so oxidation is loss. So carbon is, our ox or is being oxidized. Sulfur is gaining electrons, going from neutral to a negative charge, so it's being reduced. So we use, these, we use the electron bookkeeping of oxidation states to figure out what charge, to figure out what's being oxidized, what's being reduced. And you can keep track of it a little bit more simply, but oxidation is an increase in oxidation state. So we're going to go from, if you think about right, a number line, if we have zero in the middle, if it gets more positive, so this is plus one, plus two, plus three, if you move in that direction, um, that's oxidized. And reduction is a decrease in oxidation state. So getting more negative. So minus one, minus two, minus three, that is reduction. You do have to think about it in terms of more positive, more negative. It's so right over here. Oxidation. So copper, right, starts at zero and then goes to plus four, so it's oxidized. Um, sulfur is starting at zero, it goes to negative two, so it's being reduced. All right, so let's use then our oxidation states to identify the element that is being oxidized and the element that is being reduced in this redox reaction. So if we have 10, so let's assign our oxidation states first here. So uh, 10, we can have oxidation state of zero because it's an element, free element. Um, nitric acid is a little bit trickier. Um, Trying to remember if you need to break these apart into. I think you need to break these apart into a net ionic equation first, is the easiest way to do it, even though we don't have ions. So if we take 10, or 10 is going to be 0, that's easy enough. Nitric acid, though, is going to be is H plus and NO3 minus. So that kind of doesn't change, right? Nitric acid, we know that from before. So our oxidation state then on our hydrogen is going to be plus one. Our oxidation state on nitrogen, and again on this nitrate, we need to determine how we're going to do that. And it's, I don't even have to write up the whole thing. So the hierarchy is fluorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and then it's 6A, sorry, 7A. 7A, 6A, 5A. FHO, 765. So oxygen has a minus 2 oxidation state. Nitrogen is in 5A. So uh, oxygen is higher. Bless you. Um, our overall charge on nitrate is a negative 1. So if we have a negative 1 charge, or negative 1 oxidation state, and our oxygen is going to be 2 times minus 2. Then nitrogen needs to, sorry, 3. So nitrogen is going to be our x here. So we're going to get a negative 6. Add that to both sides. So x equals 5. So our oxidation state on nitrogen is 5. Oxidation state on oxygen is negative 6. Um, and then on our product side, 10, we're going to do similarly to what we did to nitrogen, or nitrate, in that we have oxygen. So we're going to use oxygen, oxygen's oxidation state to determine 
uh, what 10 is. So if oxygen has a minus 2, and we have two oxygens, it's minus 4. Then we're going to have a plus 4 oxidation state on 10. For nitrate, or sorry, nitrogen dioxide, again, we're using oxygen to determine what the oxidation state is. Because nitrogen is in 5A, and oxygen is higher than that on the hierarchy. So this is a minus 2. So minus 2 times 2 again, we have 4. So this is going to be a plus 4 oxidation state on nitrate, or the nitrogen. And then for water, this flips a little bit because now we have hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is farther up on the hierarchy. So we use its plus 1. So this is plus 1 times 2. And oxygen is minus 2 because it has to equal 0. Broke apart the acid uh, because it's a, well, partly because it's a, um, it's a strong electrolyte. So it breaks apart when you add it to water. Okay. So. So if it's like that, we just break the Yeah, because otherwise it gets, yeah, I was you can do it still. It right. Because then you would say the hydrogen is plus one. The oxygen still ends up being negative two. Um, and then so using those two, you determine what it is on nitrogen. But I think it's easier if you take acids like that or other strong electrolytes. So these are all, ionic compounds are easy to do because really it is just the charges. Um, molecular compounds are the one where you need to use this list. And this is technically an ionic compound, but as an acid, yeah, easier to break apart. So now we still have to determine what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. So we can maintain this idea that if we're increasing, right, so this is plus one. For increasing, this is oxidation. For decreasing, it's reduction. So just looking at each of our elements here, 10 goes from being zero to plus four. So we have an increase in oxidation state. So is it being oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. So tin's being oxidized. And then look at hydrogen. Really just go through each of these and say, hydrogen on the left is a plus one. Hydrogen on the right, still plus one. Just keep doing your thing, hydrogen. Nitrogen goes from a plus five to a plus four. So let me ask this question first before I ask if it's being oxidized or reduced. If we're going from a plus five to a plus four, is it getting more positive or more negative? Getting more negative, right? So is it being oxidized or reduced? Reduced. Yeah, so our nitrogen has been reduced. We need to do the same for oxygen. So oxygen here still is a minus 2. Here's a minus 2. Here's a minus 2. Here's a minus 2. So it stayed the same. No change in oxidation state. It's not participating here. <clears throat> and that is how you identify uh, oxidation or reduction in a reaction. You just have to figure out. And rule of thumb, not always true, but rule of thumb Fluorine, hydrogen, and oxygen are not very often going to change their oxidation state. Hydrogen would have to be bound to not even fluorine to change. I don't, even, I don't think hydrogen ever changes. Oxygen can change. Like I showed you that example with fluorine, where it's a plus two. Um, that is a very rare case indeed. OK. Now we get to learn how to balance redox. Oh, no, never mind. Now we get to wait till Wednesday to balance them. <laughs> that's, that's a good place to stop then. Uh, I definitely recommend.
starting to work on this homework before Wednesday. At least do the questions where you're identifying and the oxidation states. Huh? The, I think there's. Oh, is there a chapter? No, See, I gotta check. Seven, you put, like, three questions from chapter 16 on there. Those were chapter 7 that they were in there? Yeah. Uh, I gotta look at it. I'm like, I wrote it down. But you can go to chapter 16, find some stuff, and identify oxidation states. You just want us to find out? I'm just saying. Is there a separate homework, though, for chapter 16, question 7, or yeah, so those should have been part of this homework for chapter eight. Or, no, no, yeah, for chapter seven. Can we finish chapter? Okay. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Whoa. <laughs> Get lost of what chapter we're on. No, I'm just saying it's, 